Hi, I'm live. Uh, this is Craig Trulia. I'm an Orthodox layman. I wouldn't consider myself a fancy apologist or anything, just uh, interested in the history of orthodoxy and uh, some doctrines that pertain to ecumenical councils. And I was asked to respond to uh, Vatican Catholic slash uh, Most Holy Family Monastery. Um, they made a video called Eastern Orthodoxy's Fatal Flaw on Bishops and Ecumenical Councils. Um, I just want to say that they're sort of like, I live in upstate New York, so they're sort of neighbors, so to say, and uh, I'd be willing to uh, debate this with them publicly if they were interested or have a conversation. Um, otherwise, I have nothing denigrating to say about uh, their ministry, what they do. Um, it's obviously we disagree. Obviously, um, they would disagree with me. Um, they um, are making YouTube videos. And so we have to take it to account. They have to be interesting and uh, they can't go into hours of doctrine when making these videos. Um, and you know what, out of 10 minutes, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour, um, they're getting a lot of their uh, opinions in there and it's well argued. And I do think they've publicly challenged James White to a debate. It's something that encourages them to do um, and something that I think would be interesting. And, uh, and I've liked some of their videos. I think they argued very well their view of Galatians 2, that Kephas was not the same uh, biblical St. Peter that we think of. Um, not that I think most fathers would agree with that, but it is it was well argued. So I have nothing uh, against um, them personally or anything at any level, but I do disagree with the content of this uh, video and I invite them to respond and just take into account they do this professionally and it's all they do all day is cut up videos and, and research these things. And, and I, I work for the DMV and do this for fun. So um, hopefully this helps dialogue and helps people that are interested learn more about it. So without further ado, I'll play a first clip and I'll give a response to what I think were the, the big things that stuck out to me in this video. Um, the video rightly um, rightly critiques that orthodoxy has an issue when it comes to ecumenical councils, that there's several theories, a lot of them don't work that well. Um, and so like, for example, popular vote does not work. The ec next ecumenical council, except the previous ecumenical council does not work because again, um, if that were the case, you know, Ephesus one hinged upon Ephesus two, but that was a robber council. Um, you know, so uh, there's issues, all these theories. Also, you would never know if the Seventh Council was the correct council if you're Orthodox. So they have some, you know, good critiques and things to get you thinking. But ultimately, the video hinges upon saying the Pentarchy theory is the best one that Orthodox have. It doesn't work. And then that reception theory doesn't work. And this is where I will take issue. So let me uh, play the first clip. clip. Binding and infallible in its degrees on faith. This is associated with what is called the doctrine of Pentarchy. As Eastern Orthodox theologian John Meindorf noted about Pentarchy, quote, it became an important factor in the Byzantine understanding of an ecumenical council, which required the presence of the five patriarchs or their representatives, even as the Eastern Seas of Alexandria and Antioch had, in fact, ceased to be influential, end quote. Well, consider this. The Council of Florence in the 15th century was a major reunion council that reconciled many in the East to the Church. The July 6, 1439 Bull of Union with the Greeks at the Council of Florence, which... Okay, so we'll, we'll stop there for now. Um, it pretty much gives the Pentarchy theory of, uh, of uh, ecumenicity, which is that if the five major sees, Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Jerusalem all accept... Um, that a council is ecumenical, that then it is, and it puts us forth as the strongest orthodox criteria. Um, obviously, there's issues of this. The issue they say is that the Council of Florence met this criteria. Um, however, uh, the orthodox still don't accept it, and that means they're wrong. However, that wouldn't be the issues I take, and we'll leave that aside for a moment. The issue I take with the Pentar tar Pentarchy theory is that when did this is the how is this apostolic there was no apostolic church of byzantium is you know unless we take later legend about andrew and even that's the case byzantium had no role uh uh 
the the city of uh, that Constantinople was, Byzantium, was not a major, you know, bishopric at the time of Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea didn't hinge upon um, Constantinople at that time, accepting that council. Also, Nicaea one, Constantinople one. Um, Jerusalem wasn't a patriarch yet. So that also uh, is an issue in this idea of pentarchy. Um, another issue, particularly for Roman Catholics, but even for Orthodox that don't, would, would not put Constantinople IV, 879-880, as a um, ecumenical council, would be the fact that the pentarchy agreed on this council. Um, all the written evidence we have, Latin, manuscripts and Greek, all the written evidence, if we take the written evidence as it's not being forged in conspiracy theories, shows this council is accepted. So why don't we accept it? You had a pope accept it. So you have papal ratification. Um, we have several letters from that pope. They're all consistent with that. We have all the other bishoprics accepting it. So why don't we accept that as the eighth ecumenical council? Neither Roman Catholics do. Orthodox generally do not, though we do have some pan-Orthodox documents that cite it, and some that do not. So this does speak of weakness in the Pentarchy uh, theory. Um, so because, again, Jerusalem was not part of the early ecumenical councils as a final ratifying body, you know, arguably uh, Byzantium was not because they were not elevated yet until Constantinople I of having this sort of a lofty position that wasn't really even accepted by Rome, probably for Chalcedon, though that's arguable. There, I think, was one letter from a pope that said he accepted the canons of Constantinople I, um, which show weakness in the Pentarchy theory. But the weakness that Vatican Catholic, uh, their uh, video speaks of particularly, is that this council, um, that count that Florence. Um, was accepted by this pentarchy and so therefore orthodox should accept it so let me just play that clip real quick adherence of the reception oh i think i stopped the other clip a little too soon so i'll give what their critique was and they said everyone signed on it here's the problem with that theory they admit in the same video that the Bishop of Constantinople died. So granted, yes, he said he accepted the council and he was going to accept it, but he died before he officially did. Well, could that be construed as the hand of God, you know, stopping the Orthodox from accepting it? Uh, you, we have to be charitable with these things, right? So if, if you're Roman Catholic and you don't accept that Pope Liberius, you know, anathematized Athanasius and did not sign on the onto the Arianized Creed. Um, again, creedal statements, faith and morals meant to be taught to everyone because he was, as Athanasius said, tortured and, you know, a tortured Pope does not count. Then why doesn't a dead Bishop of Constantinople count? You know, what's the consistent criteria for that? Or I'm sure Vatican Catholic does not accept that Constantinople IV, 879, 880, was a council that uh, that is truly ecumenical, even though Pope signed on off on it, because they're I would I'm guessing they would have to respond themselves, but I'm guessing they would say, because the, that bishop of Rome, John the Eighth, was tricked, and because he was tricked, you know, it didn't really count, even though his legates signed up uh, signed off on it, and then when he received it, he said yes, I accept it at first, um, and then because we don't have written evidence of this, it's it is believed though I believe without any evidence that he must have had buyer's remorse afterwards and he didn't accept it because he was tricked. Well, let's say that's true, even though, again, we have no historical evidence of that view. Well, if a tricked, you know, Bishop of Rome signing on to a council does not count, how does a dead <laughs> Bishop of Constantinople, how does he count? And speaking of tricked, if how could the, the Bishop of Jerusalem, Bishop of Antioch, Bishop of Alexandria, who were not at that council, why do their legates, if they signed on to the council, why does that mean automatically these other, these actual patriarchs accepted it? When, when those legates came back, the patriarchs did not accept it. They held local councils and said, no, we do not accept this council. So this seems to be a major inconsistency in what Vatican Catholic is teaching um, 
And so it's, it, it's a self-eviscerating view. You, yes, you eviscerate the pentarchy view, but then you sort of eviscerate yourself in the process. And so we must presume that's wrong. And so really, we're going to get to the, um, the view of, of uh, reception, is that really reception may be the only view that saves both our respective views. Uh, because it can't be papal ratification, because a bishop of Rome said that, and I think his name was Pope Martin the first, but you know, forgive me if I forget his name, said that the Lateran Council of 649 was an ecumenical council. It's the no ecumenical council list right now. It taught faith and morals. No, you know, no bishop Rome was saying it, 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 it was bad or he was tricked or anything, but somehow that doesn't meet the criteria of being an ecumenical council when it um, it denounced monothelitism or how you pronounce it, and he called it an ecumenical council. Well, apparently that doesn't work because Rome has never received that as an ecumenical council. Um, so what is the strength of reception? Well, let me talk about that after mentioning their critique of it. Um, well, actually, I'll say this to me. The strength of reception is because Ro Roman Catholicism had a thousand years of canonized saints without official canonization process. They were received. We accept them as saints. This, this is how we've always done things. The canon, the scriptures. The scriptures existed before Council of Florence, Council of Trent, where they gave a list of the scriptures, right? They existed for the Council of Carthage of 419. They were received by the church. Reception happens all the time. You know, um, St. Athanasius, and I, I know they like quotes, so I will read the quote. You know, St. Athanasius said, and uh, the the book that he wrote was in his in the letter of, to the African bishops, but he said um, of the Council of Nicaea, Nicaea. He wrote that it is full of piety, beloved. It has filled the whole world with it. Indians, India, have acknowledged it, and all Christians of other barbarous nations, because of Easter and that day of Syria, Cilicia, Mesopotamia, differed from us and kept the feast for the same reason as the Jews. But thanks to the Lord. Harmonies resulted not only as to the faith, but as also to the sacred feast. So what's Athanasius saying in that quote? The whole world, even outside the Roman world, except Nicaea. So 316 out of 318 bishops in Nicaea except the Nicaea. And everyone who wasn't there, he's saying, except the Nicaea. It had the reception of the whole church. Or we see in Acts chapter 15, where, it's a, where they said it, it's, it sounded good to us and to the whole church. Right? So we see reception in Acts chapter 15. So it's in the scriptures. It's in the early father. Um, again, it was taught by the, uh, the encyclical, encycl encycl I can't pronounce words, I'm sorry, Enci encyclical letter of the patriarchs um, in 1848 when they wrote to the Pope. And they said, moreover, neither patriarchs nor councils could then have introduced novelties amongst us. Because the protector of religion is the very body of the church, even the people themselves who desire their religious worship to be ever unchanged and of the same kind as that of their fathers. So we see this in the scriptures reception. We see this in Athanasius saying, that's how we know Nicaea is true, it's by reception. We see this taught by the Orthodox Church in the 19th century. We see reception. And, in a, and again, a pan-Orthodox document. All the patriarchs signed off on this. Um, we even see the Seventh Ecumenical, an Ecumenical Council, which speaks of the Pentarchy view. But we have to take into account the Seventh Ecumenical Council took place before the, uh, the, the conversion of the Slavs to the Christian faith. So the whole Orthodox world that was not in schism at that time was the Pentarchy, because those seas had jurisdiction over all the localities. Rome had jurisdiction over Spain, Ireland, you know, France, you know, uh, Alexandria would have had over Africa. You know, um, Antioch over the rest of the non schismatic part of the Middle East, Jerusalem of Jerusalem, you know, uh, Greece and uh, the Adriatic coast and Constantinople and Turkey would have been under Constantinople. So if you really think without being, because unless those council fathers were ignorant of the fact that Jerusalem um, was not a, a patriarchal see in Nicaea, which I don't think so, we're going to accept that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. We had to view even the Pentarchy view as elucidated by Nicaea II as consistent with the reception view, because that's the only way to actually interpret it where it's not anachronistic and doesn't make any sense. Okay, so the reception view is fantastically strong. The question is, do we have really good criticisms of it? So let's listen to 
uh, Vatican Catholic's critique of it, and, and we should be able um, to go over that. One sec. Just on the number of bishops or the geographical distribution of bishops, etc. Adherents of the reception theory claim that a council can only be considered ecumenical if it was, quote, received by the consciousness of the faithful or the body of the whole church. Of course, they are unable to define what it means to be received by the consciousness of the faithful or the body of the whole church. As it should be obvious, the reception theory is fallacious and heretical. First, the first seven councils, which they consider to be ecumenical, were not received by all of those who purported to be part of the church. That all right. That's a pretty weak argument, because let's say Nicaea I had almost <laughs> you know, you know, uniform acceptance from everyone. We're talking about 316 out of 318 bishops, okay? And if we look at the debates after Nicaea, it wasn't what the debate in Nicaea was about which was whether Christ is really God, right? Um, Arius saying there was a time that Christ was not. After Nicaea, the debate was, okay, well, does it, do we have to say homoousios? Do we have to say Christ the same substance as the Father to me to prove that? Is that philosophically consistent with Christ being God, right? Christ being uncreated. Christ, Christ being uncreated was no longer the debate after Nicaea. That was settled, that was received by everyone. The issue that was under the debate was, being uncreated mean that he had to be the same substance. And that was something that started to be figured out. And that issue had to be received and was only only finally settled in Constantinople one, which itself had to be received afterwards. Okay. So th this sort of crit criticism does not really hold up. They also often bring up, well, how about uh, Chalcedon? We had the church of Egypt, which is huge, drop out of the church. And that'd be a fair critique if it weren't for the fact in Ephesus 1, and also in an earlier time um, during Paul Samosata, that they accepted that the church as a whole could excommunicate a bishop and have him replaced. Okay? You had um, Cyril of Alexandria accepting the story as being excommunicated and a new bishop of Constantinople being ordained and being placed there. So if we accept that the whole church right? Just like we read in Matthew chapter 18, could discipline someone and excommunicate them, they don't repent, then how is that not true of Dioscorus in Chalcedon, right? How is it not true that the fact that the Egyptians accepted this only a couple decades before, and it's actually a few years before in, uh, in Ephesus 2, right? In the robber council. So it was by defying apostolic ecclesiology that the whole church already accepted. There was no debate over it, that they went to schism. So what we really see is, this, is schismatics, schismatics not accepting these councils. Otherwise, they are received. So this first critique does not hold up, in my honest opinion. Let's go to the next one. That by itself refutes the reception theory. Second, the reception theory has the effect of denying the authority that Christ gave to the church to teach in his name in a binding and infallible fashion at specific times in a manner that would demand the assent of the faithful. For okay, so the problem with that uh, critique, number two, would be one, the quote you just saw there doesn't say that at all, right? Just because Peter has keys and we already know that the other bishops bind them loose, even if they're, which I do argue, Peter has a special charism, and that means Rome has a special charism. That doesn't mean that Rome has supremacy over the whole church. Lots of saints explicitly denied that, okay? So you can't say, well, this is biblical. That, that is a particular interpretive view that some in the church had, particularly popes of Rome, but didn't really even spread past there until, I'd say, maybe even the 5th century, um, had, and everyone else in the world did not receive it. They, they, like, they didn't view Matthew 16, 18 as that. Um, uh, a monk in the 1700s, or was it late 1600s, named Lenoy in France, counted all the, math, all the uh, quotations and exegesis of Matthew 16, 18, and the vast majority did not view it as about Petrine authority, about the Bishop of Rome. They viewed that the rock was either Christ or the confession. Okay, that was the majority view. A good, like, 20%, 25% did have the conservative Roman Catholic view of what Matthew 16, 18 is. And so we must respect it and appreciate that. Um, but this was not the majority view of the church. And some that had that view of Matthew 16, 18, like Cyprian, obviously did not apply it in the same way. So even if it's a good exegesis, it doesn't mean the application 
that modern Roman Catholicism draws from it, or in this case, um, I can't pronounce what the SEDs call themselves, but you know, other Roman Catholic splinter groups, how they view the papacy themselves um, would not necessarily be consistent with how other earlier fathers, particularly Cyprian in this case, would have viewed it. So another issue with this point number two is that it contradicts Acts chapter 15, where we actually have a council and we actually see it how it's received, <laughs> you know? So how could you have, well, this contradicts a scripture where Peter has a finally bill, ability to settle something, and yet that scripture doesn't even say that at all. And yet we have Acts 15, we have an actual council, and we see that it was received. So unless we have reception, aren't we contradicting the scriptures? So I, I don't think point two holds up either. For according to the reception theory, when a council proclaims something, even with an anathema, it is not to be considered binding or necessarily true until at a later date, perhaps decades or a century later, an undefined group of people choose to receive it. All right, this is also false. It's, it's false because it presumes that somehow councils have no power until everyone receives it, decides it has power, then, then it's like empowered after that. This is false for several reasons. One, the robber council even had power, doesn't mean it was good power because it was enforced by the power of the Roman state. In fact, all the seven ecumenical councils um, at question were ecumenical councils, were really being ecumenicals, they were within the ecumen within the Roman or Byzantine sphere of authority where they had the power of the army and law to make it so, okay. However, you could do that with bad councils like the Seminarian councils and, and, and uh, the anti-iconoclastic, uh, the iconoclastic councils and, and stuff like that. So just because you could force people to do it, doesn't make it true. In the same way, if you if your bishop's a heretic and he excommunicates you for not believing his heresy, that is a not you're really excommunicated. At least in this physical sense, they're not giving you communion, right? Athanasius really was excommunicated by most of the world. All right, so that could really happen, but that does not mean that because that happens, um, what happened to the council you know, is actually God's will, right? The power to discipline, the power to teach something as authoritative, the power to make it authoritative by force of law does not make it right, okay? So that's something where they kind of make reception sound more wishy-washy than it really is. So reception means that it's when people recognized what was already true is true. It was true the moment it happened. Nicaea was authoritative. When they made the creed, it was authoritative when it happened. Okay? The teaching on icons and constant and, uh, and Nicaea too was authoritative when it happened. All right? Whether or not it takes time for people to receive it and recognize it doesn't make it less authoritative. If it took... I don't know, the Catholic Church, 1,400 years to receive the scriptures <laughs> and accept them in the ecumenical council. Were the scriptures not true for 1,400 years? We know that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. If we bring it all the way back to uh, the Council of Carthage, were the, were the scriptures somehow not true for four centuries until the Council of Carthage happened? We know that's ridiculous. So this idea that receiving something means that something really only becomes true and binding decades or centuries later, is a, is a total straw man argument, and it doesn't even make any sense under the least bit of, you know, careful thought about the issue, okay? What gives the scriptures authority and the teaching of the church authority is that the Holy Spirit is the inspiration behind it, all right? That's what gives them authority. Whether or not I recognize the Holy Spirit's work or not is a different question. Whether or not Christians, you know, receive second and third John in Hebrews, when most doubted it for quite some time, is a different question. It doesn't mean they never had authority the moment they repent. So I think that's being a dead horse, so we'll keep going. And there's no specific time limit for this recognition. There may be a more or less prolonged period of uncertainty. The reception theory would thus, in practice, subject the pronouncements of every council to an undefined group of people, including lay people. 
That would nullify and render meaningless the very authority that Christ gave to the authorities in the church to teach the faithful in a way that demands their assent. The reception theory is clearly heretical. Besides the obvious fatal flaws in the reception theory that we've covered, there is also no support for the idea in the teaching of any ecumenical council. There is no doctrinal decree. There is no canon which refers to this act of subsequent reception. No specific statement can be found by participants at any ecumenical council to the effect that they expected their decisions to be confirmed by subsequent reception on the part of the church at large. Now, there's another issue there. One, we just quoted a pan-Orthodox letter of the patriarchs to the, the Bishop of Rome, and we saw the reception theory was taught. Two, we see it in the scriptures, and we see it in the letter from the first ever council in Jerusalem. So again, that's also wrong too. So we have it there as well. Third, like I said, the Pentarchy view, as, as elucidated by the Seventh Ecumenical Council, Nicaea II, would also be consistent with the reception view. Lastly, just because the Ecumenical Council doesn't say this is true, doesn't mean then this can never be doctrinally true. Which ecumenical council ever said any of these marrying doctrines? I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm unaware. I know that by the 19th century, the Roman Catholic Church made these marrying doctrines, but were amongst the, did they, did they dogmatically in the council say, Mary's a perpetual virgin, All right? I think they said whether she, you know, was immaculately conceived, but I don't think her perpetual virginity was under question because everyone has received that, it's accepted. It's not under debate. We didn't have to wait to the 1800s for someone to clear that up for us, right? Because it was always true. It was always received by the church. There's exceptions to Tertullian, but I even think that's arguable. But I'll give I'll give Jerome the benefit of the doubt. He says that that's what Tertullian meant in those passages. So that being said, this idea that you know the biggest flaw of all of the reception theories and ecumenical council never says. You know what makes an ecumenical council too? What ecumenical council says? You know you need the bishop of Rome to accept the council, right? You have a letter in the seventh council. No, at the sixth, I think it's a very pro papal letter. It uh, it appears to be received, but he didn't say you need the pope to rubber stamp ecumenical council. That was not what he was saying. Um, so. He was saying that Bishop Rome's last recourse, Bishop Rome essentially is infallible, that Bishop Rome said, I think his name was Agatho, all those things, right? But yet it does not endorse explicitly the Roman Catholic view ecumenical councils, nor does it need to. The Roman Catholic view does not hinge upon an ecumenical council explicitly stating the Roman Catholic view. I mean, I'm sure these guys, Vatican Catholic, wish they had a quote from an ecumenical council say, and here's the view the ecumenical council says that settles it. Because it wouldn't work, because the only view they could really, that's even somewhat explicit, would be the Pentarchy view and then the big O. That means we've got to be Pentarchist, but I'm not a Pentarchist. So, you know, clearly, you know, it, it's just a criticism that does not work that they made. Okay. And um, like I said, we have teachings of saints like Athanasius. We got the first council, and it's written letter from that council in Jerusalem, as recorded Acts chapter 15 having that it was received by the, by the church. And we have an, an a Pentarchy view that unless interpreted anachronistically could only be understood as endorsing the reception view, as far as I know, okay? So let me see if we're done with this. We'll move over to the uh, last one, but there may be one more point here. Hence, there must be and there is an objective standard by which the faithful can recognize that the church is teaching with the authority of Christ. Catholics know this is connected to the papal office, but no matter how the Eastern... All right, Catholics know this, but they, they can't quote a council on it. And I will say this about Vatican Catholic. It's not their fault because they're quoting, and they're not misquoting, um, what's his name in England, Callisto Square, right? The patriarch uh, in Great Britain. You know, he's given his view. He's, you know, he's a scholar and all. But like I said, I would take issue with what he's saying because he's actually agreeing in this with Vatican Catholic, and I just think it's historically wrong what he's saying. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes maybe people like quoting people when they're wrong if it helps make their case. Uh, but it's, like I said, what Callisto's Ware was saying there, and again, like, you know, I'm the reason theology uh, broadcasts a lot, and I, I know that Mike Lofton's kind of sympathetic to those same critiques, kind of agreeing with uh, Callisto's Ware. I don't see it. I, I don't think they are defensible. And being that they're not defensible, anyone who repeats them, I think is just making a mistake that intellectually is, you know, forgivable, but it's just not true. So let me just make a final comment on how they end their video. Formally proclaim that Florence, this rebellion among the people, this resistance to the act of the Church of God, is why God allowed Constantinople to fall under the darkness of Islamic domination not long after this resistance was manifested. Hence, it's not just a coincidence in our view that after so many in the East rebelled against the union that was achieved and proclaimed at Florence, a union that was formally endorsed by representatives from all five patriarchal sees of what they considered to be the Pentarchy, a short time later God allowed the main ecclesiastical center of power in the East, Constantinople, to fall to the Muslims and under the dominion of Islam. At all right, so... That being said, it's they're then piecing together the end of their video. Go here's the connection, of all this stuff. Here's how it all connects, man. God allowed orthodoxy to fall into the Islamic yoke as punishment for the schism against Rome. They had this one last chance at Florence, and they repented, but because they they didn't go through their repentance, they were like the the seeds around the thorns, and the root died. Because they did that, God punished them. And they went under the Islamic yoke and communism and all these things. And, you know, you might think, oh, sounds pretty good. You know, or maybe, yeah, maybe really God did do that. And it really happened to the day of Pentecost, I think, or something like that. And they'll say, yep, these are all these connections, man. It all connects, man. And the problem with that is what if we apply that to early church history, right? <laughs> if, oh, the church was persecuted worse than the Jews because, you know, they must have been really sinful in the, in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries. You know, and then they really got their act together, and that's why it became the, the religion, state religion of the uh, Roman Empire. You know, um, obviously, it, you, again, it's a self-eviscerating position. If we were to take that, oh, that's clearly punishment, um, instead of God chasing those who he, whom he loves, um, then... It, you know, then we should doubt the whole Christian religion because we started under persecution. And that would be a sign of God's disfavor. They must have been wrong, you know, and whomever else must have been right. So clearly just it's more pulling at emotional heartstrings, but it really just is not intellectually defensible. Um, an another problem with that is like they make the day, you know, I think again, day of Pentecost, isn't it? How could it be a coincidence that this happened on the day of Pentecost, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the problem with that is, like, for example, you know, Berlin was attacked by the Soviets on Hitler's birthday. Was that God saying, Hitler, because you're such a bad man, I'm going to make it where they invade on your birthday and they'll be your last days? Like, no, sometimes the enemy chooses a day to disharden you. Just like when uh, the Israelis were attacked in Yom Kippur. You know what I mean? Not everything is, uh, you know is is like this again god history is providential don't get me wrong but you can't take that in as proof that oh israel's attacked in young Kippur and they won the war they must have been right right or hitler was attacked on his birthday it wasn't because stalin was just you know kind of saying hey you thought you were such a big shot look what i could do to you right on your birthday like it wasn't just him being spiteful it, it was you know this metaphysical thing where the the fates were going against hitler for being such a bad guy you know um so it just to me to say, well, this just happened in support day. You're seeing like the Turks who, again, half the army probably were conscripted Greeks that were Orthodox. Let's be honest. You know, half, if not more, of the army were probably conscripted Greek Orthodox people. I think they weren't aware what day it was and that it made this hard in the enemy or they may be distracted or, you know, and all these different reasons for it to happen. So, again, history is providential. Um, you know, I'm sure... God would say, yes, you know, this was to teach this, you know, could, again, people were sinful. Yeah, this was because they were sinful. This means it was because of Florence, right? Um, and again, it could have been God did this because he teaches us through persecution and he gets rid of the chaff 
and um, and he has done this to Christians for centuries. All right. So I'm sure if we go to medieval history, we would also find, you know, Rome sacked on days and like, you know, tons of Roman Catholic cities like London and Paris attacked by Vikings and stuff on, again, religious holidays. We can't say that's proof that of theological issues. So I hope this response at least gives Orthodox and those who are inquiring reasons to go, okay, there's more to this story than guys in Vatican Catholic can pack into 20 minutes. All right, doesn't make them bad guys. And again, they got to make a video that gets their point across. It can't cover every book in existence. And quite frankly, it's a little more concise and well edited than what I'm doing right now. Okay, so it's forgivable. We have to respect their perspective for where they come from where and, you know, and why they think what they think. And it's not totally without merit. Uh, again, they're quoting Orthodox people that agree with them. I just have to say, I stand where the truth is, and all the arguments I just heard and played to you are were easily dismissible, okay? And I think the main thing is, I'll end on two points, is one, people are uncomfortable that, that the Christian religion oh, requires so much faith. We don't have a perfect, like, we don't have a perfect ecumenical council or something beaming from heaven that says this is an ecumenical council, right? Believe it or not, ecumenical councils were held because it was in the state interest to stop religious unrest because cohesive religion met better taxpayers and stability within the empire and less rebellions. And so, of course, there was military involved and ways to enforce it. And that's why there is really little debate about whether these things are authoritative because they were law in the Roman world. Okay. When you don't have that anymore, it's going to take something pretty cataclysmic, cataclysmic as a really heretical Christology, really heretical uh, views of worship and veneration like in Nicaea too, for us to have another ecumenical council. There just hasn't been an issue big enough. I mean, perhaps the issue of Protestantism, but Orthodoxy did have the council and, and addressed it. So again, it's, I just think there's almost this unrealistic view of ecumenical councils and it's a, a weakness even from the Roman position because again, they have councils they call ecumenical like Lateran one, and that this were laterly, later not received as ecumenical by Roman Catholicism though meets the bar of papal ratification. Also, again, Constantinople four, eight seventy nine, eight eighty. My last note would be that the position of most family, most holy family monastery, um, would be that the gates of hell have pretty much the gates of hell have. I'm misquoting it now, but that like you know, there's no pope anymore. There's some secret pope or whatnot. The whole Roman Church has fallen into decay. Then. I just don't understand their position. The gates of hell prevailed against the church. Finally, I got it. You know, and we have this promise that the church will always be growing through adversity and the church will always be expanding and the gates of hell will not be able to defend themselves against the onslaught of God in the church. Okay. And so there's been hiccups for Roman Catholics and Orthodox, but they have continued expanding. All right. And they've persisted through massive systematic, industrially systematic in the Soviet Union persecutions. OK, um, but the the issue of most holy family monastery, their view is that it that the, there's they're pretty much gone. They're like the last readout pretty much. And uh, and then you have to say, it looks like the, the gates of hell prevail. They're doing pretty good. And they say, oh, well, we're just waiting for Jesus to come back. But wouldn't the guarantee be that? The gates of hell would not prevail till the time Christ comes back. So the church should always be on a pretty good defensive ground. So we should know who the church is and the church should be holding itself together pretty decently, you know, not almost completely gone. Like the, again, the view of most holy family monastery. So they keep quoting this, you know, Matthew 16, 18. And, but the passage they keep quoting kind of, again, eviscerates their own view. So I don't understand that. I welcome the opportunity to, uh, and I'm sure they have actually videos upon videos on that issue, but maybe this to simply say, you know, how the gates of hell have not prevailed against the church when it's practically all gone. And this Vatican II has now been like, I don't know, 60 years ago almost, you know, 55 years ago. So we're not talking about a short period of time. We're almost at the point of an entire human lifetime. If Christ doesn't come back in 15 years or so, you would go a whole generation grown old and died. And there's like no pope and the, and the church is pretty much all apostate. I just... Don't see how this is defensible. Might have made sense for a few years, even maybe a decade or two, but now it's just, I just don't see how it makes sense. 
Um, so I hope this is helpful. May God bless you and leave comments and uh, watch Reason Theology broadcast, read my website, whatever. Have a great day.